the King tonight. I'm a child of the Most High God, the Captain of the Host. Mighty is our God to save, to deliver, to heal. Whatever you came here with, He's got your answer. Hallelujah. Give Him another hand clap of praise right now. Bible, let's go to Psalm 35. Amen. Man, I like to see young people get fired up while they're singing. Josh, you did a great job. Give Joshua a big hand. Amen. I tell you what, we got young people coming on that are getting anointed. Amen. We got we got young men filling roles and young ladies filling roles. We got we got new cadets. Meshach, wave your hand, a new cadet this morning. Amen. I'm excited about what God's doing in our young adult community, our youth community, and our church. It seems like all systems are on go right now. Gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs> I got a feeling something's going to happen big and quick. I'm excited for what God is doing at the Rock Church. I got a feeling this drama is going to connect with some people in a brand new way that we've never touched before. Amen. I'm praying anointing all of the actors and actresses. I pray an anointing on you that while you're up there acting, it's just like liquid fire from the Holy Ghost just flows out of you. Amen. That people are transformed as they hear uh, the good news, the story of what God has done. And then uh, Colin got the Holy Ghost last Sunday night. Give Colin a big hand. Amen. We're going to be getting baptized here. That's exciting. Amen. Psalm 35. And uh, let's read beginning with verse number 11. And uh, while you're preparing to turn there, I hope you brought your Bible. And then uh, by way of one more announcement, this Tuesday night, uh, I want you to bring pen and paper and your Bible because we don't have screens up there, so you can't, you can't look on the screen, but you need to be in your Bible. And uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to kind of continue the theme we've been on on Tuesday nights. We're going to be talking about some doctrine, and uh, I want you to be able to be prepared to have an answer. Amen. I know the Bible tells us that he'll give us the words to speak, but that's going to be from words that you've studied. Okay, that's going to be from words that you have given yourself to that God will anoint them to come to your mind, bring to remembrance. So you need to take moments like Tuesday night, and we're going to be, we're going to be talking about some of those things. So bring your Bible and a pen and paper to take some notes on Tuesday night. Let's go to Psalm 35. Uh, and this entire psalm, I would encourage you to read it. We're not going to do that tonight for the sake of time, but uh, the beginning is already in the flow of where we pick up. There is great opposition in David's life. And uh, he is writing uh, this probably sometime later looking back on it. Bible scholars believe he's writing uh, about the events that are in 1 Samuel. Uh, I believe it's the 15th chapter. Uh, but... He's evidently looking back, uh, at the very least, he's writing about the struggle he's in or the struggle he went through. So we're going to pick up in the middle of this. Let's look at verse 11. He says, false witnesses did, did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. And my prayer returned unto my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. But in mine adversary, or in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects. Everybody say the abjects. That's a weird word. The abjects. We're going to look at that in a minute. Gathered themselves together. And I knew it not. They did tear me and ceased not. And then here's another strange phrase. With hypocritical mockers 
in feasts. They gnashed upon me with their teeth. This is, this is a strange description of these people that are against David. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. That, that term in, in the Old Testament, my darling, actually means the only one, like an only child, that darling child. He said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm special to you, God. How long are you going to allow this to continue? And I want to preach tonight from this title, Party Parasites and Great Congregations. Party Parasites and Strain are Great Congregations. Now tonight is one of those nights, if you've been around the Rock Church, uh, our elders have taught us that there are truths in the Bible that heresies must come. How many know that's true? God allows heresies to come, false doctrine, uh, false faith, false teachers, wolves come in among the body, and they have one desire to disrupt and to divide. And for whatever reason, God allows it. In fact, he uses it. And there are, there are indications, as we talked about, I think on Tuesday night it was, we talked about the watchers, the ministering spirits, and those fallen angels that roam to and fro in the earth. And the good ones do it, and the bad ones do it. So there are spirits, that angelic beings, that are moving on behalf of God's kingdom, our ministering spirits, and in a weird way that I don't understand, they evidently intercede on our behalf. Because one of them, as we read last week, said, how long are you going to let Jerusalem stay like this? We've been going about looking. They've been watching. And then we see others that are going to and fro seeking whom they may devour. And they come back and report. And one of them said to Jesus, or to God, said, uh, you know, the only reason he hasn't betrayed you is because you got a wall around him. And so evidently, it's been going on a long time, and it's not any different today. So the elders have taught the apostolic church that a church needs to be aware of that, that there will come heresies, there will come divisions, and there will be spirits that work amongst the body and in the body, sometimes from without, sometimes within, to bring about a division. But God allows it to happen to prove those that are acceptable to prove those that got what it takes. That's why you ought to be in church. You ought to learn the Word of God because the Word of God is what gets you through. Now, I give that introduction because tonight this is not to a particular problem. This is like a daily vitamin. It's always easier to preach these messages when there's not an issue. And you hope that you got enough antibiotics in your system already that when the virus shows up you can you've already been inoculated all right so this is one of those that while everything is on go and all engines are up and running we're going to preach this so that when those things show up in your family or in the youth group or in the young married teams or the elderly or into the body or your maybe some of your friends or family will get into false doctrine or get into divisions you'll know and a little warning bell will go off and say, that's what the Word of God was warning me about. So that's what tonight is. This is a prevention night. It's better to take care of yourself daily instead of trying to fix it when all hell breaks loose. All right? Bow your head. Let's ask the Holy Ghost to help us. God, I want you right now. Anoint my mind, my heart, my lips. God, to impart what your word has to say. I pray strength to your people. Let the word of God grow in us tonight. God, that we would be well equipped to uh, combat with every spirit that wars against your kingdom. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Give the Lord another hand clap before you're seated. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. Amen. <clears throat> We bring you good report from Mexico this week. We ministered there along with Brother Doug Walker, Brother Rodriguez, myself, and 
and Brother Pettis, we thank God. Wonderful time with the brethren and sisters there. And God's doing some great things in Mexico. Uh, one of those things is that in September, uh, Wilson College will begin offering classes. The LEAP program will be moving into Mexico. And uh, we're going to be training pastors and leaders and uh, planting at some point as soon as all of this comes together, a Bible school in Ensenada. So pray that God helps us with all of that. And we thank God. We're going to be talking more about that. But we bring you greetings from all of those precious folks that were with us at No Limits. They send their greetings. Party parasites and great congregations. This message tonight is about, it could be specifically to the church as a corporate body. Uh, but it could also be to you as an individual believer. And if I were to categorize this in my office, I have files of sermons that are categorized into particular top topics. I have sections on holiness. I have sections on the miraculous. I have sections on relation, relationships. And this would fall under the category of surviving opposition. Because you and I, individually and corporately, are going to face opposition. There will be very real spiritual warfare that happens for the body of Christ. And sometimes that spiritual warfare comes in the form of humans. And it is important in those moments that we understand what the Word of God says, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Even though it may be a person saying it, even though it may be a family creating it, it's important for us not to personalize that issue. It's important, especially for a corporate body. It is important that we recognize when those opposing forces come that this is a spiritual battle. And you don't fight spiritual battles in the flesh. That's a revelation you need to get. If you're going to survive spiritual opposition, you're going to have to learn to pray in the Holy Ghost. There are things that happen that it doesn't matter if he or she said it, you're not going to fix it by dealing with him or her. You're going to have to get in the Holy Ghost. You're going to have to get in the Spirit, and you're going to have to pray through that thing. So that's one of the first things to learn about dealing with opposition when it comes to the kingdom of God. I'm now 51 years old. That sounds crazy to me. Uh, and I like to think of myself as a pretty likable, likable guy. I like to think of uh, that people like me. And uh, I've done my best to live a righteous life. Uh, I think I'm a patient guy. The musicians and singers may not think so much, but uh, I like to think I'm patient. Uh, I, I have done my best not to compromise truth. I've lived to the best of my ability. And I know all of us can say, I want to be better, and I do. I want to be better at the close of this year than I was at the start of this year. And I have done my best to be a people person, a lover of people I am, and I have never knowingly hurt anybody. If I did, it was with ignorance and not with intent. But can you believe with all of that that there are people that don't agree with anything I just said And if you're honest, in your life, there's probably some people that are highly offended at you and you can't seem to figure out why. Any, anybody raise their hand and say, I can relate to that. Because in their mind, you have purposely hurt them, abused them, or worked against them. And probably 80% of the time, you had no idea you were doing what, that, what offended them. Can I get a witness? And I have experienced in 32 years of preaching, I've experienced a lot of opposition. I have, I have experienced demonic opposition, literal voices. I've had phone calls in the, the middle of the afternoon and answered the phone at the church one day. And on the other end was a demon-possessed person that began to call my name. And begin because I had been dealing with an issue in the church and it was some 
demon-possessed person that was a friend of the issue I was having to deal with. And I have, I have felt the, the fiery flames of hell's uh, puke as it comes out, as it, as it attacks. I, I have had friends turn their back on me. I have had people lie on me. And my story is not any different than your story. Every one of us have been lied on, mistreated, talked about, cheated. Can I get a witness? There's a song in there somewhere. But I still believe in a God that cannot fail. And if you're a new believer, I, I wish I could just tell you that you're going to live happily ever after. But you may have been in the church two weeks and you've already figured out not everybody's perfect. And you're going to have people let you down. But worse than that, you're actually going to have people do you wrong. And you're going to have some severe oppositions, especially if you begin to do the will of God. Because the will of God is contrary to everything this world and its fallen system stands for. Do not think for one moment that when you go to build an apostolic revival church that it's going to be easy. Don't think that you're going to get up and preach a revival truth and that everything, that the, the, the city fathers are going to open the door. Oh, you want to build a church here? Great. Here, here's a check. Let's help you. Doesn't work that way. When you get a vision for God for your business or for your family or for your dream, it doesn't work that way where everything just falls into place. But with every dream, with every revival, with every vision, with every step forward to a, somebody said, forever new level, there's a new. I don't know if that's true or not. I think there's five forever level. And I have experienced some hurt. I've experienced some opposition like you have. We've all had people walk away. <clears throat> Walking away is, is hurt. It's painful. You know what it's like for a loved one to walk away, a husband, a wife, a child, a friend. Uh, and there's always that, that feeling of pain in a pastor's heart when someone leaves the church. Well, I, I repent. God forgive me. There's been a few people I was glad when they left. In fact, if I'd have known, I'd have probably helped them pack. But, but for a normal situation, when people walk away, it's not a joyful thing. But let me let you, let me let you in on the truth. Not everybody that leaves is going to hell. I'm helping you right now. There are, there are some times that it just doesn't work. Okay? I know that. I understand that. Okay? And I don't, I don't hold. This is the way I was raised, okay? And it worked. See, I'm still saved at 51. So it, it, it'll work. If you'll listen, it'll work for you like it did for me. I understand that there's some ministry that just don't jive. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to be honest. There are some preachers I couldn't sit under, and I am a preacher. Bishop, was I not supposed to say that? <laughs> I'm just being honest. And, and I get it. Not everybody likes me. I'm helping you right now. You're going to lose some people in life just because y'all don't get along. Don't lose your mind over that. If you lose a friend, that doesn't mean they're terrible and over and done. I couldn't sit under every preacher. I'm not going to hold people to a standard that I wouldn't even live up to. 
So I understand in my ministry there are, there are good people. I can name I can name two or three families right now that are good people, and when I see them, I love them and they love me. But they're no longer under my ministry. You know why? Because they couldn't they couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. They were good people. They weren't a bunch of devils. They were just good people, and their their idea of a pastor and what a pastor was didn't work with me I didn't work with them it, it didn't kind of fit what they needed and I understand that I'll be honest it doesn't feel good when when they look at you and say you know it's not working out for me with you I wish I could change that but can a leopard change its spots and they can't change who they are now I know this is not spiritual authority 101 like you're used to hearing but this is the reality of it but here's the other dimension is there are also people that not only walk away, there are people that walk away with the intent to destroy everything they just left. Now, that's not happening now. This is, this is, this is prevention for when that particular heresy comes. I'm being a pastor today. I'm not screaming and we're not running yet. Maybe we will in a minute, but I want to help you. And it's important for you as a church the reason, here's a danger. Let me tell you the danger of making non-salvific issues salvific when they're really not is when the real devil shows up, the people don't know the difference. You cry wolf enough and people aren't going to recognize when the real wolf shows up. So there may be people that leave over a job or leave over a family situation or have to go take care of uh, mother or father or maybe a job transfer. Or maybe life, it just didn't work. That's where you've got to recognize as a mature saint of God, yeah, that, that, that's just something. Yeah, I wish they could have stayed with us. It, it just didn't happen. But you've got to recognize that's what happened to be able to sting, distinguish when it's very different from that. This is, this is medicine tonight, all right? Are you with me? And there will be times at some point, not happening now, but in the next year, in the next two years, there will be someone that departs the faith that may become reprobate concerning the faith. They didn't just leave because it didn't work out. They didn't just leave because, you know, it just they felt more comfortable somewhere else. But they leave with the intent of destroying what God has done. Let me tell you something. That's a dangerous place to be in. A very dangerous place. There are some that don't just leave. They leave with the intent to destroy. How many here have ever faced opposition in your life? Let me see your hand. The psalmist was writing at this particular time in his life. He was evidently dealing with very strong opposition. And it's during this time that it's possibly, scholars say, the greatest turmoil in his life. You remember the situation, the cave of Adullam. This seems to be the time frame of his ministry, 1 Samuel 24. And he's, he's literally running from cave to cave, village to village. He's at times having to feign madness to survive. He's having to associate people that, that he used to fight against and will fight against later. But he's just trying to survive. And the amazing thing is that all of this is happening while he is completely innocent. Don't overlook that fact. All of this, Brother Mono, is while he is completely innocent. There were enemies, he says, that are working against him. Verse number 7 of chapter 35 or Psalm 35, he said, they laid a trap for him like, like they did for lions. They dug a pit. They disguised the pit. They hid a net in it. And then they had laid, it was as if they were waiting. They were scheming and planning and trying to devise a means to totally capture David and destroy him. He said that there are people that had planned to do things. He said, I was, I was totally unaware. He said, they were laying out all of these schemes. He said, I'm just trying to survive. And while I'm trying to survive, they're working and scheming to destroy me. And then he evidently remembers how evidently these were some of the people. Don't miss this. These were evidently some of the people that he had helped in time past. In their adversity. 
when they had gone through things, when they needed help, when, when there was problems in their family, when there was problems in their marriage, when there was problem with their children, when there were problems in their life and finances. And here it is that in, when they had needs, he said, I, I treated them as if they were a brother. I treated them as if they were a mother. I bowed down. I, he said, I humbled myself. I fasted. I prayed. I tried my best to help them. He said, but in verse number 12, when it came to my adversity, he said, they rewarded me evil for all my good. Does anybody ever feel like that happens to you? Just lift a hand if you ever feel that way. Just somebody. And it's, isn't it interesting that our enemies don't seem to hurt us as much as our friends that betray us? That's the way it is in life. Because you kind of know your enemies are your enemies. You kind of know who they are, but... But David said, man, when it was one that was close to me. And I want to help you because in life, that's going to happen. Young people, there's going to be a time in the next, if you're a young person, let me just tell you, this is the way it happens. In the next two or three years, one of your dear friends is going to do you wrong. I wish it wasn't that way. But it's going to be those times that seemed to hurt the most. If it was your enemy, you'd just take it and say, well, that, it's war. That, that's, just come on, bring it on. But, but when it's your friend or when it's your family or when it's someone close to you, it hurts deep. This is the time in his life he said they rewarded my, my good with evil. He'd done his best to help them in their time of trouble, but they're not there for him. Why? Something at some point caused them, for whatever reason, caused them to turn on David. And he can't seem to figure it out. That's kind of the way opposition is. We find ourselves fighting opposition. We're saying, this doesn't make sense. That's part of the frustration is, 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 is we can't nail it down. We can't figure out where we offended him. We can't figure out why it all started. Why did, why did he turn? Or why did she turn? Or why did she say that? Or why did he do that? And, and I mean, I thought we were, I thought we were friends. I thought we got along. And, and now it's, now you're opposing. Why? What have I done? And he sought for answers. He wanted to make sure his heart was right. And he said, my prayer returned into my own bosom. That indicates it was a private prayer closet. Can I tell you, that's what, that's one of the first things you do. Don't go outward, go inward. Not locking up emotions, but going inward to a place of private prayer. Don't get on the internet and start telling everybody everything that's done wrong and who's done you wrong and creating more problems. You see what happens when you do that? Is you drag other people that wouldn't even know anything about it. You drag other people into a fight that's not their own. I had a situation a few years ago with, with, with a minister, another minister, and it was, it was not a, an enjoyable thing. And a, 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 a few, few comments evidently got out and and uh, honestly, it was, it, was, it was something that was, was pretty significant at the time. And uh, so happened that that preacher was connected with another preacher friend of mine. And he kind of got word. And, and he, he asked me, he said, well, what, what, what do you want me to do about this situation? And I felt like God gave me an answer. And I told him, I said, you know what? That issue is our issue. That's not your issue. So I'm not going to get you involved in the issue I'm dealing with because you need to let God use. If you're going to use him and God's going to use you with him, I'm going to let God do that. I'm going to, I'm going to keep you out of it. Don't drag other people into your mess. Because you may work through yours. You may work through the process, but they may not. It's better if we just go to God in prayer and say, God, I want you to work on me. I want my spirit right. I want to make sure everything's right with you. He said, my prayer returned into my own bosom. But I want, to, I want to talk for a moment. There are times when it's more than just issues and personality and philosophy and ideals. Sometimes there is deep heresy that comes in the form of false doctrine. I remember my father leaving a general conference. Unction of the Holy Ghost sitting in a church service at General Conference. He felt God speak to him, say, get up 
and go home, there's a problem. He went home, and unbeknowings to anybody, uh, there was a false prophet that had been coming to church that had begun to uh, draw new converts to him uh, and was having secret meetings in uh, the, the church with these new converts that were not really grounded in doctrine and truth. And uh, my father felt the Holy Ghost tell him when he arrived back home, he arrived at night, he got in the car from the airport, dropped my mother off, and drove straight to the house God showed him. And when he pulled up to the house, there were all kinds of cars parked out in the front, and that false prophet was sitting there. My dad stood outside and listened for a moment as he was teaching false doctrine against the apostolic truth. And you could get, ask my dad the story. I'm telling the truth, ain't I, Dad? And my dad stood there for a minute and walked in, and that, that man was sitting there holding court, just teaching false doctrine. And when my dad stepped into the room, that man immediately switched like a demonic presence and began to applaud and, and, and act like he was in favor of my father and immediately switched trying to manipulate the pe people. And my dad rebuked him and saved some of the souls. But sadly, there were a number of those new converts that were destroyed because of that evil seducing spirit. Saint of God, you need to thank God for a church that preaches grounded doctrine. You need to thank God for a church where you can establish yourself in the Word of God. There are false prophets. There are false teachers. There are internet gurus that want to get in your home and destroy faith and family and doctrine and marriage. They want to destroy faith. But we hold to truth. And so when those spirits rear their head, they are dealt with. And at some point, those things may happen. You may hear Bishop, you may hear Bishop Young, you may hear an evangelist. I've seen it happen. I've seen evangelists come to this pulpit not knowing one thing and immediately begin to, begin to prophesy and speak to direct issues. I was in the old building one night and there was a man that was causing disruption and had done people very wrong and cheated them out of thousands and thousands of dollars. And in that revival service in the old building, I was, I was only uh, a young person preacher and I, I didn't know a whole lot at that time and I remember standing and boy the Holy Ghost was moving it was rocking and I was kind of over there on you know where Bishop used to sit in those green leather chairs and and uh, I was kind of on the edge of that platform and it was the Holy Ghost mosh pit and uh, he was praying he said I'm going to pray blessing over some of you and I was standing there and boy people were wanting wanting blessing and I watched as that man that had cheated people out of thousands and thousands of dollars came up and stood and uh, he said he said I just happened to be right there I think God allowed me to see it I was standing right there. The evangelist was standing right there. And the man said, said, I pray for me. I want a blessing from God. And the man said, in Jesus' name. And just as he went to lay his hand, he went. He said, I can't pray blessing on you. You don't pay your tithes and you cheat people. It was the truth. See, God has a way of dealing with those oppositions. And so as a, as a mature church, you recognize when the Spirit is moving. I remember one night there was, a, there was a man that had had great influence in this church. And as years went by, months went by, he had influence in this church. These are back in the early days. And it wasn't long after that that he went near here and started a church and began to undermine the leadership of Bishop Wilson, who was the pastor at the time, and uh, undermining. And some of you lost precious family to the false doctrine that that man began to teach. And I'll never forget on a Sunday night, Brother Wilson stood up right in the preliminaries. We had an evangelist. He, Brother Wilson wasn't even preaching. He was the pastor. And I was just the youth pastor. And I remember sitting on the second chair. I was going, oh, my Lord, I've never been in a service like this. And Brother Wilson got up and marked that man publicly. And he said, as of tonight, that church is no longer in fellowship because of false doctrine and it's undermining. And he said, within six months, that church will crumble. In six months, almost to the day, that church crumbled. That church is no more. That property was sold. And I think now it's, they don't, they, I don't even know what that church is. It's a whole different group. Bought the property, moved on. And that ministry shut down, moved out of state. The list goes on. Because when there is opposition, there is a spiritual fight that takes place. And when there are spirits of rebellion, everybody say rebellion. I've seen spirits of rebellion come in churches. 
Come in ministries, come in saints, come in preachers. Ministries that, that are affected by spirits of rebellion. It's not a new thing. It was going on all the way back in the Old Testament throughout the New. There was rebellion all the way through the Word of God. It's one of the things that we deal with. So as saints of God, we've got to be cognizant of this. So this is a night where we learn to recognize rebellion. David looks back over his life and he takes inventory and he recognizes, he said, you know what, God, I have tried to do the right thing. I know I'm not a perfect man. I, I know I've made mistakes, but God, I, I, I'm not guilty of what these people are accusing. This church, if you will, is not guilty of what these people are saying. This group is not done. I, I just kind of put yourself in this. This is David saying, God, here I am. Just look at me. I'm an open book. That's what he says. He said, he literally said, I behaved myself. He said, I was accused of things that I didn't do. They lied about me. They gathered together against me. In verse 15, he said, they rejoiced and gathered together. And then it uses this abject, abject. He said, the abject gathered against me. What does that mean? I took the time to study that word. It has to do with the vile. One translation literally said, those considered scum. Now, I'm not going to use that language. You scum, get out of here. That's the language of the Bible. These abject... Other places it is, it is translated as the smiters. Those that were troublemakers. Those that were abject. They, they just wanted to cause problems. Isn't it interesting that when those spirits show up, they always seem to find the other friends. Birds of a feather... And David said the abjects, the vile, the smiters, those that are always looking to cause problems, they seem to find each other. Have you ever noticed when you get in opposition, opposition doesn't seem to have any problem finding somebody to party up with. You ever notice, young people, when, when somebody turns on you it's never just one. They always got two friends they can go to, and those three friends or four friends will be sitting over on the side talking about you. We call that clicks. But understand something, that's a very real spiritual realm, is that David said, I looked around at what they were doing, and he said, the abjects, the smiters, they were gathering themselves together against me. You know, I have seen this in my life. I have seen, I, I, I preached a revival. I'll never forget, I'm telling a lot of stories. Is this all right? John Shoemaker and I were young evangelists. We traveled together. And we had, I'd preach one night and he'd preach the other night. And I think we had like four sermons total that we could preach. If the revival went over, God forbid, we didn't know what we was going to preach. And we, we were scheduled to preach at so-and-so's church in such and such a town. And uh, we got there, and we pulled in. Well, what happened, he, he canceled us. It was like Tuesday. He said we were supposed to be there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday off, and then Sunday morning, Sunday night. And he said, he called us, and he got a hold of us. And young people, this was before cell phones. He had to track us down. That makes me feel real old. But he tracked us down. He said, hey, don't come till Friday night. We're just going to do Friday and Sunday. We said, okay. So we killed time until Friday. We arrived at the town on Friday, and uh, we got to church, got checked in. The, it was a little dumpy town with a little bitty Motel 3. It didn't even qualify for a 6. <clears throat> and uh, we got there, and uh, we got to church, and he said, hey, I need to talk to you guys. And he said, come to the office. So we went to the office. He said, hey, uh, we're going to have church tonight and uh, Sunday, but he said, when you're done preaching, turn it back to me. He said, because I got some special announcements uh, that, no, that I'm going to make. And he said, no, I'm going to rephrase that. He said, uh, here's the deal, guys. I'm resigning tonight. We said, okay. He said, so let me, I'm going to make an announcement, then y'all can preach. So he got up to the pulpit. Imagine this. We're all of like 20. 
22 and 23 years old, trying to preach revival. And he gets up and he said, now before the evangelists come tonight, he said, uh, I'm going to have a special meeting in the fellowship hall after church with all the, the members of the church, and I'm going to be ri- resigning as pastor. But we want to have a good service tonight, so I want these evangelists to come. Needless to say, we didn't go back on Sunday. But we found out later, there was a group of abjects, Brother Wilson, that had risen up with some people that had controlled that church for years and that were stirring up division in the body. And they had worked and they were withholding tithe from the church so that the church wouldn't function. And they said, we're not going to give any more money until that preacher gets out of here. They literally starved the preacher out and he had to leave town. Well, if it had been me, I wouldn't have waited around. I'd have gone across town and started another church or something, but I wouldn't have waited around for that. But I've seen it. I could go through a list of, uh, of stories. I've been around this a long time. I can tell you about church trouble on top of church trouble. I can tell you about rebels within and rebels without. Y'all okay? Say amen. amen. And he said, these smiters... These vile fellows, these troublemakers, they began to group together and their business was not kingdom business. Their business was for their personal kingdom. And they got together, their attitudes, their smiter, their attitudes, their rebellion brought them together and they wanted to join forces to destroy Your enemies will always seem to find other people to help tear on you. They'll find it on the internet. They'll find it on the party line. They'll find it on the phone. They'll find it in the youth group. They'll find it in the young married couples. They'll find it among the grandmas. It knows no age boundary. It knows, it knows no racial boundary. It knows no social strata. It will find somebody to unite in its smiteful efforts. Just get used to it. You may as well, you may as well get used to it. Everybody say troublemakers. Say rebels. Just give them a few days and they'll find somebody that has the same feeling. And they, here's here's what they do. They will keep record of every mistake. And that's usually how they recruit. I'm helping you. Young people, I'm helping you. Young married couples, I'm helping you. They will get at parties our friend gatherings after dinner. Any elders know what I'm talking about? Say amen. And they will drop little lines. Dad, am I telling the truth? And they will drop little statements about, well, you know, brother so-and-so. You know, brother Anthony's really been going through it at Rockland. They've, they've experienced some setbacks. Oh, Really? Yeah, well, you know, Brother Anthony, you know, you, you remember when he was a teenager. I'm telling the truth. They'll get on the internet. Do you remember when he was 18 years old? He really don't believe like he does, like he says, because I remember him as a teenager. I'm telling the truth. Do you know what she did? I remember when she was 23 years old and single, and she hadn't changed one bit. She's 47 with grandkids, but she is still the same when she was 23. And they'll find two other women that'll run their mouth the same way she's running her mouth. And before long, they're having a whole tear her up party. It'll happen with ministry. Well, I don't like the way Bishop had that building painted in 1967. Well, they put that door on the wrong side of the auditorium. And they'll nitpick. But by the time they get four or five stories... They have created this cloud of deception and perception 
that puts in the mind of people and it begins to create, they begin to foment this and it creates a system to buy into. They keep record of every oversight. They keep record of every mistake. They keep record of every inconsistency. And when they get together, it's as if they know how it's supposed to be done. Brother Young, this is the weirdest Sunday night. Oh, it's going to get weirder. I don't have the screens, but if you got your Bible, look at verse 16. It says, with hypocritical mockers in the feast. Hypocritical mockers. I looked that up. That literally is referring to a particular group. This blew my mind. I'd never seen this. They were called cake mockers. Or later on, they became known as party parasites. Cake mockers, it just sounded better, party parasites. What is a cake mocker? What's a party parasite? This is from antiquity. This is what the Bible is using. There were people that would be known historically as cake mockers or party parasites that did not have money or wealth. They did not have invitations to hang out with the elite and the wealthy. But I found out, Luke, that they figured out a scheme to where they could enjoy the festivities of the wealthy. And they would become like courtroom jesters of medieval times and they became known as cake mockers that they would come to your party let's say you were a particular uh, political persuasion and that you were all of the uh, we'll call it the just we'll just make it up we'll call you you're, we'll call you the Republican party and we'll call me the Democratic party or we'll call you the Pharisees and we'll call me the Sadducees. And they would find out that you didn't like that political candidate or you didn't like that particular guy that was on the Sanhedrin or you didn't like that particular lady that was on the Supreme Court or was in the position of leadership in the town. You wanted that position or you wanted that influence. And so what they figured out is the cake mockers would find out that you were having a birthday party for your 17-year-old daughter or son. And it was going to be a big celebration or your daughter's wedding or your son's wedding. And there'd be this big party and every word's out that so-and-so is, is going to have a big party. And, and so what they would do is they knew that you don't like so-and-so because you're in opposing forces and you stand for this idea and he stands for that. So what they learned to do is cake mockers, they would come to your party and entertain your guest by mocking your opponent. And they would come and they would tell lewd jokes. It's where the idea of roasting came from. They would have grand dinners. And at a certain point in the party, the cake mockers or the party parasites that were living off of the wealth of the rich so that they could taste the sweet cakes of the wealthy. They would come and would lewdly and rudely and crudely, they would make fun of your opponent or the people you were against. And they would come and spit. They would have the entire facility laughing at how ridiculous your opponent was and how ugly. And they would make fun of their character. They would make fun of their flesh. They would make fun of their children. They would make fun of their business. They would lie. They would, they would win, uh, write big tales and lie and exaggerate and write cute songs and roast them and make fun of them and would have them for dinner. And this is the words that David said. These cake mockers or party parasites were gnashing me with their teeth. They were living off of what other people's issues were. And when those spirits of opposition stir up in a church, there will be people that step in to add their story because they want a little piece of bread. They want a little feeling that of acceptance. Oh, yeah. Well, wait till I tell you what he did to me. And then it starts. 
And David said, they gathered against me. These party parasites. And it's almost as if he reaches the point. Proverbs 28 and 21 refers to this. It says, for a piece of bread, that man will transgress. There are people that will transgress for just a little taste of acceptance. They'll betray you. They'll betray your family. They'll betray God. They'll betray the church. If they can just be accepted by a particular crowd, a little group, if they win, maybe their rebellion, they never got a footing, but they see yours is taking, so they'll go join like a party parasite. They'll latch on and live off of your struggle. I'm preaching tonight. How many dinners in my lifetime have I heard about how people tore ministry up and tore saints up and tore leaders up, tore churches up, where they found a common enemy, they tear people down at dinner, then they invite specific people over to their house so they can influence them. I'm preaching to you. Brother Young, is that going on? No, 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 not that I know of. Honestly, I don't know of any of that. But this is medicine for when it happens. Because what I want is the Holy Ghost when you get invited to that house and you didn't know it and you sit down at the table and it starts. Step back. Say, no, 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 no. I'm not a party parasite. I will have no part. You're not going to tear down my church. You're not going to tear down my youth group. You're not going to tear down the family of God. You're not going to tear down the ministry. You're not going to tear down the way God works. You're not tearing down this apostolic faith. Doesn't matter if you're my family. Doesn't matter if you're my friends. It don't matter. It don't matter. I will not be a party parasite. David is at the point of being overwhelmed. In verse 17, he said, Lord, how long will thou look on? He said, rescue my soul from destruction. Has anybody ever gotten to that place when you're in opposition? Raise your hand just fill over like, God, I, I can't take it anymore. Come on, be honest. I need you to raise your hand so somebody knows they're not the only one, right? We've all been there. It feels like everybody's against you. You feel like you're going through it alone. You feel like everybody's against you. You feel like everybody's talking about you. You feel like everybody's turning in. And I know that pressure. It's, it's a pressure we all feel. It feel. And then the devil gets involved and starts attacking your mind. Anybody know about that? It just weighs on you. You feel like everything's going to collapse. And the devil starts telling you, you're never going to pastor this church. You're never going to make it. You're never going to save your children. You're never going to make this marriage last. You're never going to be able to pay for this. You're, and the list goes on and on. Do you know how many people made up stories about this church? If you knew how many phone calls I got, I literally got a phone call one day from a friend of mine that said, Brother Young, this was like 2009, right in the heat of all the financial stuff. They, didn't, they said, Miles. They didn't call me Brother Young. They said, Miles, hey, man, what's going on? Hey, are you okay? Yeah, Why? Dude, I heard y'all are about to lose your church. I said, who told you that? Well, I'm not going to tell who told me, but are you working a job? Yeah, it's called pastoring. <laughs> no, bro, I, I, heard that, I heard that you had to take a job and your wife had to take a job because y'all were having to pay the payment or y'all were going to lose the building and it was going into foreclosure. <laughs> They were wishing that. Do you know how many of those lines I heard? Do you know how many stories I've do you know how many stories I've heard about the Rock Church? And the list goes on. Bishop's been around a lot longer. My dad's been around a lot longer. They could start at this side of the building and tell every one of us a story about some kind of crazy story like this. The devil will make up stories, and if you buy into those stories, you'll start believing those stories. You'll start thinking, well, maybe there's something going on I don't know about. Man, is people leaving? Is, and, and boy, you, you, you can't even sleep at night. But here's what you do with opposition. This is what you do, because when it comes, this is what you do. Brother Anthony, am I preaching? Am I helping you? You're a pastor. Get ready. Sure you want to do this? <laughs> I love this. Maybe I'm preaching for Anthony Pizarro tonight. 
I'm preaching to Jesus. <laughs> Boy, I'm in the Holy Ghost, though. You've been under it, hadn't you? You've been fighting a fight. And then you've got to be Jesus. Why are you in the fight? Maybe it's on purpose because you'll feel really like him. But here's what you do. I've only given you the first half of my message, party parasites. The second half is great congregation. It's not near as long. Because David said in verse number 18, here was his answer. I will give thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. I was reading that a couple of weeks ago, my morning devotion, and I felt like the Holy Ghost told me, said, that's how you deal with opposition. He said, you remember, I gave you a great church. It's a great church. And I felt like God said, don't you get focused on the knuckleheads that don't want to follow. Don't get focused on all the parasite party goers. He said, there's a great church. You get back in that church and you get with that congregation and you praise God. Because for everyone against you, there's a whole bunch that are for you. Hey, I want to tell some of you the devil's against you and telling you nobody likes you. For every knucklehead that don't like you, there's a body called the church that loves you. You're in a great congregation. The Rock Church is a great congregation. I don't care who talked about you last night. I don't care who lied about you last week. I don't care how many walked away. You get back on Sunday night and say, I got a great church. I got a great God. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Everything's going to be all right because I'm a part of a great congregation. The way you deal with party parasites is you go worship at the house of God. You get to the house of God and you praise God with much people. If you've been going through something, here's what you need to do tonight. You need to look at somebody and say, you know what? I've been going through it. I need you to come magnify the Lord with me. Because I feel like I'm all alone. I feel like nobody cares. I feel like they've been talking about me and misusing me and mistreating me. And that's the way I feel. But, but I'm going to hear the word of God that I'm with a great congregation. And right now I need somebody to praise God with me. That's how you deal with party parasites. If they're going to get together and tell everything wrong, we ought to get about 100 or 300 or 400 that get together and talk about how everything's right. I wish I had some praise party people that would say, I'm just gonna praise God because I'm in a great congregation. I'm with a great body of believers. I got a youth group, I got a family, I got a choir, I got a drama, I got a family of God. Brother Young, is it that simple? Well, that's just what David did. And I've, I've learned he, that's kind of the way he operated. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. When things got going wrong, maybe he'd cry a little while, then he'd go get his heart and start praising the Lord or dancing before the Lord. Hey, this is a great church. Full of great people. Let me, let me, let me tell you something right now. Lazy, no good people don't build all this. Smiters, don't build this. Bishop said, scum, don't build this. You know who builds this? People that just get up and go to work. This is a great church. This is a great youth group. I don't care what anybody says about the Rock Church, young people. We got the best. Yeah, look here. Put that camera right on me right now. 
We got the best young people on planet Earth. And we got some of the most cool, anointed, talented young married couples on planet Earth. I love every stinking one of them. We got the best singers, the prettiest women, and the most handsome men. We got the smartest kids and the best biscuits in town. Lake Wobegon don't have nothing on the rock church. This is a great congregation. We got the greatest God. We got the Holy Ghost. We're going to new levels. We're going to revival. So let the parasites party. We're going to party in a great congregation. We're going to worship with a great congregation.